the statement or declaration of a witness. Evidence in support of a fact or a statement. An open profession or declaration. Testimony. All right, everybody. How's everybody doing today? You doing well? Can we welcome all of our online with us, our online church? Tell them we're so glad that they're... Hey, we're, we're going to jump right in this morning. I want to welcome a friend of ours, Casey Cease. Would you guys give him a big welcome as he come on, comes up here? Casey, <clears throat> I told you last week that we were going to have a special guest, and this is, this is that guest. I've known Casey for a while. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But Casey, I'm going to catch you up as we kind of kind of catch up as to what we've been talking about before. I feel like I'm on Oprah. You are on Oprah. Thank you. That's Check under your chair. At. No, I'm kidding. This. <laughs> There's nothing there. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. Some of them are like, wow. <laughs> did you take your medicine today, Casey? <laughs> okay. Yes, I did. Okay. Here we go. Imagine what it would be like if I didn't. I know. It would be awesome. Right. Okay. Actually, I know. We've yes, been in we've those situations out. before. All right. Um, we've defined testimony this way. We'll, we'll show you. Firsthand authentication of a fact, um, an outward sign or evidence. And then we've, we've been talking a lot about just how our lives are the evidence of a living, loving God, a holy God. Um, you know, something we say a lot around here is that we're, we're not, we, we are an important part of the story, but we're not the what? The point of the story, right? And then all things are for the glory of God, obviously. So our life is to, to, to be lived as an evidence. Um, we spent some time talking about how uh, Joshua 4, we were there stacking the stones, you know, build the, uh, the, the Ebenezer, um, that, that our lives should display the power of God, the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God. I think we, there it is. Um, and we, we talked about Ephesians 2, that all of us have a but God story to tell. You know, here's, here's who I was. Here's what was going on maybe in, in my life. Maybe it was as simple as, you know, maybe it's not like your story that they'll hear today, but maybe it's, you know, I was... Um, raised in the church. In fact, when I did a lot of early student ministry, I would t tell my story, my testimony. I would say I had a drug problem as a kid. My parents drugged me to church my whole life, right? <laughs> terrible. <clears throat> it's a terrible joke. They laughed better online at that than y'all. Um, but, you know, we all have this Ephesians 2, 4, in some situation, a but God story to tell. We looked at Psalm 23, and I don't know if you've ever done this before, but, but I felt like that this was actually a testimony of David. You know, it, and that was an interesting way that God spoke to me through that. Because how many times have we read Psalm 23? And all of a sudden it was just like God was just saying, no, this is, this is David giving a testimony. Um, we looked at Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, that says, you know, and they, 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 they conquered him. They overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. But we did not miss the last part of this verse where they love not their lives even unto death. And so we've talked a lot about that. Psalm 145.4 is a big part of our church. In fact, God used that verse to name our church. One generation commends to the next or entrusts to the next, passes down those stories to the next, and declares the mighty acts of God. So it's, it's both active and it's something that, um, well, I, I should say it's, it's very active in the sense of, uh, you know, we're intentional in how we're discipling. Uh, one another, but also the, the younger generations, but also we're intentional about just declaring the mighty acts of God. We talked a little bit about turning that corporate, if you will, I know, and um, we kind of talked about that a little earlier, but, but it, we all have a personal testimony, and you actually came to me with this as well, that, that we also have this corporate testimony. We'll talk more about that. And, um, you know, we ended last week um, with 1 Peter 2.21, which I thought was a very a uh, powerful statement of a verse that says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example, leaving our lives as a testimony that we should follow in his steps. And so what happens when sacrifice is part of your story? You know, and honestly, I think that, that that's really the way of the cross, right? That's, that's the Luke 9, 23, the Galatians 2, 20 thing that God calls us to is to deny ourself and, and carry our, you know, take, pick up our cross and, and begin to follow Jesus. We, we even said something like, you know, it's not true Christianity if it only produces worshipers but not followers. I thought you'd like that statement, by the way. <laughs> so this is Casey Cease. He's a good buddy of mine, pastor, um, friend. I've known you for... Almost 20 years. Almost 20 years. I knew you. Actually, can we show this picture? I knew you when you were this guy. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> Actually, Identical. Think, yeah. <laughs> Where'd the earring go, dude? It's like you were in a 90s boy band. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Tell us about your family. I think I got a picture of you and Stephanie. 
Yeah, so Steph is my high school sweetheart. We actually met shortly after um, the incident I'm going to share with you about this morning. And so she was 15, I was 17, and the guy you saw before is who showed up at her parents' house to uh, <laughs> stay at her house because they wouldn't let her go out with me yet because she was 15, I was 17, and I had just recently gotten in some trouble. Um, memo, though, I did take the hoop out before I went over there. Um <laughs> Because I'm not a complete fool. So uh, she's my best friend. She's been with me through thick and thin. We've been through a lot together. Uh, she's been a pastor's wife and knows the uh, dehumanizing uh, instances that can be taking place in that moment. Uh, she has been a mother, uh, is still a mother, and knows how um, that, yeah, those are our kiddos. Uh, Braylon, who is my doppelganger, and then Abigail, uh, who is eight. And uh, so, but Steph, Steph understands kind of the, how, how it's easy to feel forgotten in the years of parenting as a mom and um, what it means to be remembered by Christ through all that. Braylon loves Jesus and uh, is into apologetics and is smarter than I am. So I have to say, I will look that up and get back to you a lot. Um, and then Abby um, is uh, young in the faith, wants to be baptized, not thrilled about being plowed under the water. Uh, by her dad, and I think she wants to be Presbyterian, not so much based on theological convictions, but so that she doesn't, she can do the sprinkle thing. So we're still, <laughs> we're still, you know, kind of navigating that as well. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. So you've been a pastor, you're an entrepreneur. What else? Tell us before, before we go back, tell yeah. us kind of a little bit about your, I'm, your journey. I'm in joyfully unemployed. Uh, joy <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, I own a few companies. Uh, I own a book publishing company called Lucid Books, and we have some imprints there. I own um, a business development marketing firm called Planify Agency. Um, I also do uh, uh, leadership development coaching yeah. for kind of high end. Um, I, my, my primary area is people who are on an upward trajectory, um, and it's very lonely in, in that kind of sphere. They've had ex success, and but there's life's out of caliber. Um, and so they might have the money making down and the success down, but have kind of lost themselves in their mission, uh, their family, their children, or their teenagers. Uh, and so I walk with them, and then uh, I play drums at my church most weekends, and then I'm an auxiliary pastor when our pastor goes to Africa or something like that, uh, work with nonprofits. So I'm ADHD, and I've been redeemed. Yeah. Um, and shout out to Dr. Johnson, who's here. Yeah. I know HIPAA, he can't acknowledge, confirm, nor deny that he's helped me out, but... <laughs> I can testify that uh, he's been wow. a huge blessing over the years. Here's that. Um, okay, so how do, how do I move on from that? Let's see. You, uh, <clears throat> you are also an author yourself. Yes. Is that what led, led to Lucid? Is no, Lucid uh, was, um, I was traveling and preaching like you were traveling and doing uh, music, and my mentor, Rod Brace, who was a chief uh, regional officer, uh, re uh, president at Memorial Hermann, chief learning officer there, uh, self-published a book, got very frustrated with the process and said there needs to be an author-centric solution mm -hmm. to publishing that really helps people get their message out. And so he said, but I got promoted at work, and so I think you should do it. Mind you, I'm dyslexic, so the irony is thick. I relearned how to read when I was 22, uh, and I'm a publisher, so uh, good luck. And um, But you're not the editor. So no, thank the good. Lord. No, they're <laughs> much good. smarter people than I that actually yeah. edit the books. So, uh, yeah, so we, we've done over, uh, the big word is over a thousand SKUs, which uh, I'll not Baptist count it for you and say about 400 titles, um, but different <laughs> expressions of it. So, um that was for your background. Yeah, you. yeah you're welcome. Yeah. Um, and then Planify Agency is a marketing business development growth uh, organization taking uh, businesses that uh, have experienced success but have never really had a formal marketing or growth plan. Uh, and so we have a great team there that helps organizations really regain focus, make a plan, and really go after the next level of growth. So, um, and you've also been a church planner. Oh, yeah, I've been a church planner. Tell, tell, tell me about that. Just I'm, like. I'm 28 years old, and this is what I look now. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's, the, that's true. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like my dad being a Vietnam vet when he gets together with his war buddies. <clears throat> you kind of just gather and they, they grunt and look at each other and kind of nod and they know. Um, I want to say this declaration. You all here today are an answer to prayer um, way before you even knew about declaration or that declaration was out there. Uh, and so as a fellow church planter, um, I understand the chronic feeling of being a seventh grade boy being dumped over and over again that church planters experience. Uh, and, I, and I say that with joy for Jesus, right? I mean, fortunately, our boss, right, as church planters, Jesus, 
had his best friends betray and leave him, yeah. right? And he still prayed for them. He still loved them. He still cared for them. He still wanted best for them. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, we, we planted a church. We were there for eight years in the Woodlands Magnolia area. Yeah. Um, and then we were actually part of another church plant prior to that, too, prior to that. Um, and we're actually back at one of the ones we helped plant in the Brenham, Texas area. So um, I do not work for Bluebell. People ask me that. If I, I'm like, oh, I'm from Brenham. They're like, oh, you work for Bluebell? No, there's other stuff there. I, but can you get us gift cards? That's the question. I do know a guy. I can hook <laughs> you right, up. So. There's that. Okay, so tell us what led to all this, though. Yeah. Get, take us to the backstory because you, I, would, I think that a lot of our life circumstances is, is kind of what God uses to shape us into who he's called us to be, to the destiny that he calls us to, yeah. the purpose that he you know, has. Ephesians 2.10, you'll mm-hmm. talk probably about that a little bit, but just that purpose that he had beforehand, it says. Yeah. T- tell us about your life of what led you to this moment yeah so uh and you know my story and i know i have limited time i could talk forever uh which you can probably tell um being a preacher but i think some highlights that would be helpful to bring context around this i my father was uh raised by a jewish father non-jewish mom um and uh was very intelligent but didn't like school was about to get kicked out of college, so he enlisted in the military, uh, in the army, flew helicopters in Vietnam, came back, post-traumatic stress, finished college on the dean's list very quickly, went to law school, did that in two and a half years. Uh, Married my mom after he got back from Vietnam, they met and got married. Uh, And so there was a lot of trauma and post-traumatic stress, like in my environment, my mom had experienced trauma uh, growing up, some abuse, uh, emotional and physical sexual abuse, and so, um, my upbringing was, was anxious and tense and driven. When I, I know those words now, as a little kid and as a teenager, I just thought it was life. And it really is. I mean, I don't know many human beings who've lived outside of their walls that haven't observed, experienced, or shared in some traumatic situation. So I'm not saying I'm unique by any means in that, in that way. Um, but also it was challenging where I felt I was, it was always confusing as a kid. I felt like I was smart, but I, everything felt harder for me uh, at school. So I hated school. Um, I would distract myself by worrying about stuff going on. Um, and I played sports, but I wasn't that great. But my dad was just this big time dry, driven achiever at this point. And he was like, you know, he was the guy that would coach at third base and think that I would be motivated like he would. And he'd come up and say like, hey, no pressure, but you need a home run right now. And I'm like, dad, in the last eight years I've played baseball, I've never hit one home run out of the park. Right. And so, you know, kind of that tension. Uh, Mom was still is just loving, giving, generous person. Um, You know, I was always a mediator, peacemaker at home, get in the middle of fights. You know, my parents were arguing or sister and parents, Uh, just very stressful. Even as I share right now, I feel kind of some of that, that stress and anxiety of, of walking into that. And so, Uh, I learned around fourth grade that one of the ways that I could get around feeling stupid was to be funny um, and then also to be a people pleaser. So if I could help people out, be helpful, and I could be super funny uh, or try to be funny or if that wasn't working, be stupid and then people laugh at me, not with me, then I would would kind of deflect the fact of how I was experiencing life inside. Went to church on and off when I was, uh, my father, uh, when I was about six or seven years old, I uh, heard a Messianic Jewish man speak and was really compelled by the story of Jesus. And so we started going to church some, found another church close to our house. We went for a couple years. I didn't quite get it all. Um, I, I wanted It was basically just very transactional to me. Uh, if I mess up, I have to say sorry a bunch. If I say sorry more, it kind of recharges the battery. Uh, and then I can get away with more stupid things the next day. Um, you know, so it was very transactional. Like, uh, gotta stay, you gotta keep the odds in, in your favor with the Lord, but I didn't understand the gift that was presented or get, given. So I had some exposure. I was confirmed a United Methodist. Uh, I went to three out of 12 classes. Um, so that's 25%. They're still nice and let me pass. Um, <laughs> didn't know what that meant. Um, and then youth group was strange, and so I didn't go very much. Junior high, I got popular, went with girls, got dumped a bunch, as I mentioned earlier, similar to church planting. Um, and, uh, and then I, uh, yeah, lived in A-Leaf. And it's so, amazing how God uses those situations in your life to prepare you. <laughs> you can tell, man. Yeah. Like, they quit liking your posts online, quit yeah. liking your kids' pictures. You know, you're like, it's, they're out. They're yeah. out, man. Like, it's the same thing as, like, seventh grade. They quit answering your call. They yeah, yeah, don't yeah. meet you at your locker. They're out, right? It's just kind of yeah. the same thing, so... And I'm not picking on any of you. Some of you are like, 
oh, man, I better go like Pastor John's picture so he doesn't know <laughs> we're praying about leaving, you know? So, uh, yeah. he, has, he has an intern watching that. Um, no, but in all seriousness, uh, you know, so junior high, I consumed myself with stuff, with girls. My dad was a successful attorney. Um, and then we moved from, I lived in A-Leaf, so I was, had friends of all different nationalities, Love rap and hip hop, and then we went and moved to Sugar Land, uh, which was a culture <laughs> That's shock, bro. <laughs> you know, so uh, you know, so we moved to Sugar Land. My sister went through a traumatic event at school uh, at the beginning of our freshman year. We were dri- my freshman year, her junior year. We were driving back and forth from A Leaf uh, from Sugar Land because we had all of our friends out there. But after that event, we transitioned to Clements High School, which was a complete culture shock. Um, I played sports for a few days. I played football because I wanted to play baseball, but I didn't like football, so I quit. Then I played baseball, got cut from the baseball team, so I ended up doing theater in high school. So I was a thespian. <laughs> Super cool for my kids to brag about to their friends. Oh, uh, my dad was a star linebacker. My dad was a star actor. Yeah. Yeah. But struggling with anxiety and depression, I, started, I went to a psychologist the first time in third grade because I felt nauseous all the time, was worrying, obsessing. Um, feeling stupid. They didn't really grab on. My grades were decent enough. I could figure out a way to get by, um, you know, on and off into counselors. I uh, had to have seasons of depression and a lot of anxiety that would kind of exhaust me to depression. Um, in high school, I was really angry uh, about what happened to my sister, stuff going on at home. Uh, so I carried a lot of anger, a lot of frustration. And the school I moved to, Clements, was highly academic, still is. Like, very academic, and so I, I felt pretty dumb, and I, I didn't know where I fit, and so I started hanging out with some different groups of friends. I tried drinking uh, alcohol uh, a few times my freshman year. Second time, a buddy of mine got real sick, so I was like, I'm never doing that again, but that following summer, I began partying, um, and I realized now, looking back, right, I was trying, I found something that numbed what I was experiencing. Um, went with a few girls. I was a long-term relationship guy, uh, 10th grade. I started dating a girl through 11th grade. Uh, I was doing theater, you know, making it through school. So the girlfriend and I broke up, um, and I took it hard. I mean, I I didn't have emotional boundaries. I would give myself away to people. And looking back now at 43, I'm like, (laughs) yeah, big big whoop. But back then, it was like big deal. It was a severing in some ways. Um, And how old are you at this point? I was just turned 17 years old, so... Uh, July 4th, 1995, uh, almost 26 years ago, I, uh, July 4th, we had a party at my house. I invited a few friends. They invited a few friends. Um, we had a keg of beer there and uh, was drinking. My girlfriend and I had just broken up about a week prior. And then I had an old girlfriend come over that uh, I was my quote-unquote first love, uh, first like, first lust, whatever you want to call it. Um, in middle school, but we had remained friends. She had come over, and I was trying to get back with her, and she was into someone else, and she was was making some choices that were baffling to me based on everything she had going on. But latching, compounding that with other stuff that I had going on, I I finally, at about 1.15, 1.20 in the morning, I I snapped, and I said, you know what, forget it. I'm out of here. And I said something like this to her. If you're going to kill yourself, then I'm going to beat you to it. Now that I know what that sounds like, and it's not easy to share, honestly, but I want to be transparent that I said that. I was being dramatic, but when someone says something like that, you take them seriously. And so I got in my car at a Z28 Camaro, and I began pulling away, and so she screamed. I, I, I didn't hear her scream this, but later I was told, oh, my gosh, he's going to kill himself. And so my buddy ran and sat in front of my car, and they blocked me in one car here, one car behind me, and... Um, uh, and uh, then, then I turned my car off. Now, mind you, my parents were home, but they were asleep at this point. Didn't hear anything going on. Um, they thought it was just kind of a chill hangout, 15 friends or whatever. And so they, someone said, hey, let, he can't go anywhere. He's blocked in. Let's just leave him alone. And so all of a sudden, my friends started walking away, and I sat there, and I was just like, I want to get out of here. And I looked around. And I realized if I hopped the curb and went around the car in front of me, I could get out of my neighborhood. And so I got to the exit of my neighborhood. I, I left. Um, I hopped a curb, left. And then friends were running after me this way. And then over here, there was a, a little four-foot fence separating my parents' cul-de-sac from the main street over there. So apparently one of my friends ran that way, but no one had seen that he went that way. 
And so I go out the back of my neighborhood and get to the exit and stop there. And I remember breaking down crying. At this point, not a born-again believer, but saying, oh, God, why? And then just thinking, I just want to go home. And my vision was to let off some steam, go home, kick my friends out, and, you know, who knows what. Didn't really have a good plan. So I started heading on the road, and I was going probably 70, 80 miles an hour on this main street. The car was fast, and I was upset. It was 1.48 in the morning, and I didn't figure there's anybody out. And I, I wasn't so wasted or so drunk or inebriated that I wasn't in control of my, at least, physical faculties. Get around this curve, I'm going about 80 miles an hour, and all of a sudden I see a friend of mine out in the middle of the street with his arms up like this, trying to stop me. And so I, in a flash moment, try to jerk my wheel. He jumps the same direction, and his body rolls up the hood of my car, comes through my windshield, and bends my steering wheel back like this, and the airbags come out, and I lose control of my car. And I end up knocking over some trees, and I end up in a tree, and I'm, I'm passed out. And then I remember, next thing waking up, my friend Blake, there's smoke all around, my friend Blake, uh, who was a lifeguard coming to my door said, Casey, we got to get you out. The car's on fire. We got to get you out. And so I started screaming, who did I hit? Who did I hit? He said, Casey, calm down. You didn't hit anybody. You just hit some trees. I said, no, I know I hit somebody. Please go look. And so he pulls me out of the car. I still remember like it was yesterday laying on this wet grass with smoke coming up. And I remember saying, God, please take me instead of him. God, please take me instead of him. Please take me instead of him. And I see my friend run. I'm laying down. He runs, stops, and takes off the other direction. A few moments later, my dad hops the fence, comes over there, and he gets down in my ear, and he says, don't say a word. Remember, my father's an attorney. And my dad later would say that, having been a Vietnam vet and seen some horrific things, he says he's never seen anything so awful. Mm -hmm. One, thinking that I was dead, and then he ran, he saw my friend was hit, and we later found out was killed instantly. Um, so police, firemen went to the hospital. I didn't know yet if he was gone yet until a few hours later, a police officer came in and said, Casey, or he said, son, we need to take your blood. A young man's been killed. And so at that point, I didn't care if I lived or died. And quite honestly, fight or flight kicks in, right? And you're like, I, I would never want that to happen. I mean, ever. Uh, but the effect of my actions are different than the intent that led to my actions. Yeah. My parents made a wise decision, and when I was released from the hospital, uh, put me in a mental hospital on suicide watch, and my friend's parents actually came to see me in the hospital, uh, the, the mental hospital. I had met maybe them once in passing, but didn't really know them, but they came in and said, Casey, we're Christians, and we want you to know that we forgive you and that we don't want you to hurt yourself. We know that John wouldn't want you to hurt yourself. Uh, and they asked me if I had ever known Jesus. And I was like, yeah, I've been to church, you know, because I thought that's, I mean, if, if you had to choose one, I would choose that one, I guess. But I was functionally an agnostic because I like to curb my bets, my bets, but I didn't know Jesus. And so went to my friend's wake. I, the doctor wouldn't let me go to both, so I chose to go to the visitation. I remember seeing him laying in his casket, and I can still see it today. And uh, talk about feeling shame and guilt and useless and broken. Yeah, I felt all those things. And so I started going to church. I started trying to be religious. Religion didn't really provide much. Uh, it's just a bunch of ritual and a bunch of things, a bunch of transaction. And... Uh, as my senior year started, I met Stephanie. I was reading it. My mom bought me a student Bible, and I was reading the New Testament a chapter at a time, slowly. And I started realizing that this guy, Jesus, didn't hang out with people that had it all figured out. In fact, he had some pretty hard words for those who thought they had it all figured out, mm. but that he was very welcoming and inviting and open to those who were broken. Yeah. And he, he was and is in the business of healing and fixing broken things and using them. Yeah. So at the age of 17, Jesus saved me. I didn't, I didn't go to a Baptist church, so I didn't have a bunch of altar calls. So people are like, how many times you pray the prayer? It's like a bunch. And if any of you think I have to come forward and pray a prayer, I'm glad to for your conscience, but I believe the Lord 
has saved me. And, uh, and so part of, part of my probation, I graduated high school. A few days later, I went to court. I played no contest, a 4-3 state jail felony, negligent homicide, was a brand new believer. My friend's parents wanted me to face consequences, understandably so. But they, they argued that let's give him a shot outside and see if he can do something positive. And so I asked the judge if I could speak to kids about the dangers of drinking and driving, the importance of making good choices. And so uh, with my theater background, um, you know, he was like, well, you can do some of your community service as a part of that. And so I started speaking. I was on the front page of the Houston Chronicle and immediately started getting calls the next day to come share my story. And so I hit the big time my first time out speaking at a driving school with about 14 of my peers uh, sharing my story and half of them hating my guts because they were judging where I was. Um, but as a young believer, I felt the Lord was still near and had something for me to use. And, and for whatever reason, he wanted to use that story also. Um, and so part of my offering in relationship with the Lord was to bring that story and to continue to bring that story whenever the opportunity arises to point people to the all-loving, all-gracious, all-merciful, fully just rescue of our souls, Jesus Christ. Mm. And so over the years, I've had the opportunity to preach to large groups, small groups, met you speaking at camps. The Lord fortunately gave me other stories to share from the Bible, so I was able to bring more to the table, to pastor people, to help start churches, um, to marry my wife, to grow in faith, to to no longer curse the limitations that I have from my learning challenges or the seasons of anxiety and depression, but to see them as seasons that the Lord uses to allow me to lay down in pastures and for him to restore my soul and to meet wonderful people and to be an encouragement. But um, yeah, I mean, so that that's kind of, yeah, and you, you know all that, <laughs> yeah, but you did, you obviously did. we're we're doing an interview so y'all can hear also, so you did a fast forward there, but yeah. um, you know, I think one of the things that, especially when we think about testimony, that as I read Revelation, it's it's just kind of formed in me this this um, the gravity in the fact that God really does want to redeem all things back into Himself for His glory, even our story. He wants to use our story for his glory, as hard as those stories sometimes can be. You know, so like last week we talked about sacrifice, and, and I even told him, I said, I don't, I don't understand this passage in Genesis where God tells Abraham to take his, his son Isaac and, and potentially sacrifice him back, you know, worship, worship God through this sacrifice, only though now we can see that that was a picture of what God was going to do with Jesus for us, right? But God wants to redeem all these things, and so um, even hard, painful things like this, talk to us about, because it's a process, right? It, was, it had to be a process to go from that first moment of realization when your dad whispers in your ear to um, through the legal process, through the first time that now you're, I guess we would call it kind of a rehabilitation program. Did you... Did they have the ankle monitor and all that stuff back in the day? Or No, I had a breathalyzer in my car, yeah, which you had to do that, right? took forever to turn on. And so you're sweating your face off. Right? I see some of you nodding. Maybe you've had one. <laughs> yeah. In order we're, to we're not supposed car, to admit right? that at church, right? Like, no, I, oh, alcohol's <laughs> but, bad, right? But that's, yeah. what, that's how you started your car, right? Yeah. Yeah, you had to, you had to do that. Yeah, it was super awesome. You want to go on a date, honey? <laughs> You know, 15 minutes later, you have to blow again. 30 minutes later, you have to blow again. Then yeah. sometimes it false, uh, it falsely says it's broke. You're drunk when you haven't had a drink, and yeah, it's crazy. So yeah, so but know, I mean, all that compared to right, 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 so, right. I mean, but but this process of that that immediate like the gravity of shame. Yeah. Right. What was that like? To to at what point did, were you able to realize that you weren't wearing that? as much anymore as you were understanding that God was using this, you know, as, as hard as that was and as painful as that had to be for many people, but now God is using this thing. So talk, talk to us about your kind of your mental state, because I would venture to guess that maybe there's a lot of story that we have in our life that we have concealed, that we've compartmentalized, that we've, we don't want people to know about us, right? And 
And some of us may still be living in some of that same shame, not recognizing the redemptive nature of and the forgiving nature of God. So talk, talk to us about that. Yeah, it's hard to delineate, especially someone that's wired more as a people pleaser. It's hard to understand and accept the Lord's forgiveness when you feel so unforgiven by groups of people. That, that's difficult. And I think sometimes people can be unaware and flippant about God's forgiveness, um, meaning that because you're forgiven, you shouldn't face any consequences for your actions. Um, and so I think there was a maturing process. I mean, I was sure. a kid. Uh, I would say it wasn't really the, the real first iteration of, of liberation that I experienced was around 2015, 20 years later, as far as like not daily carrying it around as like, that's my story. Yeah. You know, even though I knew I went through seminary and I knew <clears throat> theologically correct, I knew that that we're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, that we've been forgiven as far as in love, as far as East and the West, but kind of that, that gravity of, of shame being, being ongoingly uh, a motivator, if you will. And, and so in some ways you can say, well, it's like the initial rockets on a ship that what, what burns to get you to a certain place can't maintain you to the next place. Yeah. Um, but I think also there, there were iterations of it. You know, when I finished high school and came to faith, uh, I began sharing my story and seeing, seeing God use it to invite other people out of the shadows into the light. That was a, a step that the Lord blessed me with to see that it's not all wasted. Right. Uh, when the Lord delivered me from any inclination towards compulsive pornographic materials and behaviors or whatever at the, in the late 90s, and being able to share that and see other men and some women say, oh, there, there is freedom in Christ to not have to follow those patterns or habits any longer. Um, even my shame was pronounced as super embarrassing. Um, those areas, to see the failures and God's redemptive work, that really all that I was going through wasn't just for my own good, but collectively for the body of Christ for our own good and for the good of the greater community around us that would invite other people into God's kingdom through Christ. Yeah. Um, and so I would say, you know, getting married uh, in 2001 was a benchmark of re-identifying where the Lord emphasized his care and love for me by not only allowing me to be his son, but now to be a husband. Yeah. And I think those marks where we're able to have children um, is another place where the identity is there, there's more for us to be doing um, because I think there are God-ordained identity markers in all of our lives, child of God, a son or a daughter, a brother or a sister, a niece or a nephew, a grandson, grand, right? These different things that were made by God for God to be, to be markers of our faith and our life and creation that sometimes those relationships are broken, but Christ is in the business of mending relationships, that through the relational connection with the Lord and with some covenantal relationships, we're able to re-anchor. I mean, I would say one of the biggest pieces, if I look back, that was an undercurrent through it all, even though my family was pretty close, I often felt alone. And a lot of people I sit with today, I would still say that one of the foundational misses in our faith is that we don't realize the relationship and the nearness of our Lord that relates with us even in our broken places that welcomes us to a, an existence that never fully knows aloneness again. Mm -hmm. You have a life verse. I have a lot, yeah. What about the, the first Timothy? Oh, the one that we were teeing up to preach on? Here we go. You yeah. ready? Yeah. This is my, one of my life verses. Um, yeah, first Timothy, uh, just to build, bridge some context. So Paul, uh, known as Saul in the Hebrew, uh, persecutor of Christians, very smart, PhD level training, theology and, and uh, Tanakh and, and uh, the Old Testament as we would call it. Uh, persecuted the church, had people killed, was radically saved by Jesus. And he writes this to a, a young disciple of his, Timothy. And, and we'll take a running start in 1 Timothy 1, verse 12. Um, he says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointed me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, insolent opponent, 
but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying, this is it, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. There's a reason, not just because, man, I'm awesome, but as an example or a testimony to others who will believe. Mm-hmm. That our stories are, are, are illustration markers, not just our story, but our story. Mm. And could you even quantify, like, obviously this is all praise to the Lord, but how many, just make a guess, how many people do you feel like have stepped into the kingdom because God redeeming this tragic story. Well, I hope he still is today. Yeah. Um, you know, and I don't know. I mean, I've. Many, many, many. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been with you multiple times when you've shared the story and seen many people surrender their lives to Jesus for the first time. Powerful the way God can use. Even a really hard, uh, full of suffering, traumatic story yet still to redeem and to um, receive glory. And I think twofold on that, John, is, is one, those who feel too far gone can latch onto a story like that and realize they're not beyond the That's redemptive right. power of Christ. Yeah. But also it's been preventative in many ways that people can look at a normal, maybe not very normal, but a person, <laughs> a human in front of them, hear a story, And realize their path is going that direction of destruction. Mm. And and the Lord is kind to use that story as an interrupter to reposition and redirect their life and choices. Right. And so I I would say if if to endure all that I've endured and still at times endure would afford someone here today to not have to endure that same type of pain before they understood and embraced and trusted in the all-powerful, all-ever-reaching, all-redeeming love of Jesus Christ, then it's, it's been worth it, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. So we've just kind of skimmed the surface. Now, I, I asked you yesterday, I said, do you have any books? You know how he's a, he's a publisher and an author, and I said, can you bring some books? He goes, I have two copies. <laughs> And they're blemished. So, so, <laughs> so, to be fair, we planned this like a week ago. Yeah, we did. So. Show, show everybody the, the book cover, if you will. But this is Casey's book. And notice with Carol Jones. Carol actually edited. If you, those of you who remember Carol, from, she actually edited Casey's book for him. And so that's available, I guess, everywhere where books are sold. Amazon, yeah, or you can ask, reach out to John and say, hey, yeah. I want to copy. There's an audio book that I didn't read, although my voice is quite buttery. I found a voice actor I really liked, and it saved me a bunch of time. <laughs> Being a dyslexic guy reading your own audio book, not necessarily great. So, Wow. There's so many times I don't even know how to respond to you, Casey. But <laughs> That's my the, uh, whole calling here. <laughs> Who flusters the, Pastor John? The, yeah, thank you. Um, but you also did something pretty cool in this book, too, is, is towards the back of it, you actually help people to understand how that they can use their story and craft their testimony, right? Yeah. So I would love for, in fact, can you get more copies? Because we'd love to have oh, yeah. something that we can Yeah, get. I know a person. Yeah, yeah I, know I can people. get copies. I know people. And I'd be glad to donate them or, you know, use it for a donation here to, well, uh, to help. So anyway, uh, I can be a blessing and use that story. And, and part of that piece, right, is now that you've heard this story, it's not just my story. But as believers, it's our story. Yeah. Right, My daughter Braylon, who's 14, hasn't massively rebelled. Lord willing, she won't, but yet. And she's like, as a believer, she's like, but I don't have a story like yours. And I'm like, praise God. Yeah. I'm like, and no offense, but it, if we're, if we're going to match testimonies, whose is better? Yours not living into the flesh that was fallen and broken, yeah. I, I would say is a bigger testimony of God's faithfulness yeah. than those of us that lean into our flesh and sin in the worst possible ways, 
And again, fortunately, it's not a competition, but I would say there's miracle in that. You know, when, when her friends are like, oh my gosh, I got so drunk. And she's like, oh, I haven't really ever had anything to drink. And they're like, oh my gosh. You know, they judge her and then they call her later when they feel broken and desperate, right? Mm. To live, she's not judging them, but she lives differently. Yeah. Right? But yeah, yeah. so it's, it's, it's that place of like, hey, when Jesus says, be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, there's a way to do it without being a strobe light of jerkism. Yeah. <laughs> causing people to go into angry fits of seizure rage of yeah sorry i we can edit that oh, gosh yes know. please let's edit that um but i will say uh you know that is one of the i think that's a misstep that sometimes we we um or it's just a, a misunderstanding like we don't have to go create some dramatic testimony for god to use us god wants to use us just as he's created us he wants to use our love for him i think just as much as he wants to use the hard moments that we walk through or the struggle or the sin or whatever else. He, and he can use all those things. That's the thing is I think sometimes we often, we, we take too much control of it or we think that we have more power to save than he does. <laughs> yeah. but, but Fortunately, the good news for you is you don't do the heavy lifting. Yeah, we don't. You're an illustration. Yeah. Here's the story. Here's this person's story. The Lord does the heavy lifting. I don't know yeah. about you, but I, I don't know how to take out a heart of stone and put a heart of flesh. Yeah. Yeah. God does that. So I just say, hey, Lord, take and use whatever I have here. And, you know, as Paul says, one person scatters a seed, another one waters it. But yeah. ultimately, it's God who brings the harvest. Yeah. But we're so afraid to scatter seeds because we're like, well, what if it falls on the sidewalk? Throw more seeds. Yeah. Refine the seeds. Get a better spreader. Open your eyes. I don't know. Learn. I practice. Yeah. I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to do something. I'm going to tell on one of our people, Pam, if I can. I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Sorry about that. I should have asked, but it's in the moment. But Pam called me the other night because she just really felt compelled during our prayer service that, that we're supposed to be more bold about sharing, you know, who Jesus is with people. And so she felt led to do that with a, a door-to-door sales lady the other day. She said it was the most awkward conversation she's ever had. And that's exactly what I said to you, right? That's okay. Hey, it's seed. You, 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 but then the question is, do you have to buy the knives afterwards? Right. Right? <laughs> If you're talking about how generous God is. Okay, Lord Jesus, thank you. Yeah. Amen, God. <laughs> I'll take the biggest one. Oh, gosh. Uh, well, thank you for sharing your story. I, I, it's, it's interesting because I've heard that a lot from you. I've heard that, that story many times. But being this close to you, when you share that, I actually still see it in your eyes. Like I, I saw the I, I mean, the picture you showed of me by myself with the hoop earring, everybody's laughing at, what they missed was a sadness in my eyes because that was the spring after the crash. And so I make fun of myself because it's easier than being sad about it. And I rejoice in the redemption work that God's been doing. Yeah. But there's still a sadness and there's still a longing of, and questions that I won't have answered until I get to be face to face with my Lord. But that doesn't mean we give up or that we lose heart, but that we That's press right. on. That's right. So this morning, can we just pray for a minute? And um, I'm going to ask you, maybe you're here and you, you heard Casey's story. You've never really surrendered your life to Jesus. You've been religious. You've gone to church. You've tried all the things. Just like Casey said, it, it's felt way more transactional than transformational. And God wants to speak deep into your heart this morning a message of love, of forgiveness, of redemption. He wants to redeem your life, your story. And if you've never invited him to take charge, maybe right now in this moment, I believe the Bible says simply call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Jesus, I believe. Maybe you would say that in your heart or even out loud. I ask your forgiveness. Would you come into my life and completely empty me of all my yesterdays, all my pasts, and change me and make me new and fill me with your spirit, I pray. In Jesus' name. With your eyes still closed, if you prayed that prayer this morning, I'm gonna invite you. There's a connect card somewhere close to you. Would you grab that? Would you fill that out? And would you place it in one of the give boxes that you'll pass by in the lobby? It's an orange and white box. There's, 
There's one kind of by the banners behind you or to the, I should say, to your left. And then there's one on the way out. Would you place that card in that box so that we can reach out to you this week? And where you are this morning as well, I just want to invite you. Maybe you feel far away from God this morning. And I just want to um, encourage you. That if simply you would say, Jesus, would you come near? You can already know that he's right there. He's with you. And maybe right where you are, would you just ask him, God, would you give me clean hands this morning? Would you give me a pure heart? Would you point out anything that you might find in me that grieves you? Let me feel your nearness again. Can I just declare this over you? Because of what the scripture says, and if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. He will forgive you as far as the east is from the west. He, he will not hold these things against you. In fact, he chooses to forget And so this morning, if you've come before your Lord and you've said, would you give me clean hands and a pure heart, God, would you forgive me? Just know that Jesus on the cross absolutely declared yes over you already. And you are forgiven this morning. Amen? Amen. Hey, let's stand to our feet. We're going to respond to the Lord through the table today. And then we have a special time of prayer for just a minute over some of our dear missionaries that, that we um, will be sad to see them go, but we're excited to see them go to take the gospel back to um, their home country. But before we do that, can we just respond to the Lord just in a little bit of worship? Let's come to the table together. I believe everyone's welcome at the table, but I, I will say this. I, please, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus and you're not ready quite yet, Here's what I believe. If you're in the house, God is pursuing you passionately. Man, he loves you. He's got such a blessing and favor for your life. He's got such a purpose for you. But if you're not quite ready just yet to surrender to him, I just want to speak that blessing over you and tell you how much he loves you. And just in this time, would you just stay seated where you are and just receive the love of God as he pours out upon you? The table is for everybody, but it's important that we approach the table in a biblical, right, worthy manner with clean hands and pure hearts. Because the Bible says if we don't come in that manner, then we really drink wrath upon ourselves. And we don't want to do that, okay? And so that's why we'd just rather speak that blessing over you if you're not quite ready to surrender your life to Jesus right now. But here's what it's all about. Jesus on the night before he was crucified on our behalf, sat with his intimate close friends and he took bread, not really like this, but similar for the sake of illustration. <clears throat> and he said, this is my body. Notice it's whole. See, Jesus was whole. We were the broken ones, but he willingly and obediently and faithfully allowed himself to be torn and beat and broken so that we could be made whole. He also took a cup of wine on that night that would represent his blood, that he would willingly and obediently allow to be spilled out to not just cover sin, but to take it away. He was full and we were empty, but he willingly emptied himself so that we could be filled. And so this morning, as we worship, we thank God that we're forgiven. Amen. We thank God that, that he made a way for us to be free and have friendship with God again through Jesus. And so as we respond, as the team leads us, um, when you're ready, over here to uh, your right and to your left, and also in the back of the room, there's three stations. You can either come and, and receive a piece of bread. We call this intinction. You just dip it right into that juice and take and eat and drink. And the Bible tells us as we do this, we declare his death until he returns again for us. Or we also have these prepackaged, if you're more comfortable with this, the prepackaged elements, and they're at all three locations. And so as we worship, when you're ready, you can move towards that and let's come to the table of the Lord together, okay? Let's sing and let's worship and let's respond. Stir a passion in my heart, God, let it
give the Lord a big hand of applause this morning for all he's doing, who he is, all he's done, amen. Hey, would you welcome our friend Casey? Thank him for his story. We're going to honor him today. Thank you. Real quickly before we go, I just want to pray. Is, is you can sell it usually here? I want to ask you, Excel, and these lady come up. Sam and Leslie, why don't you come as well, will you? Come on up here. Come on up here, Excel. First of all, thankful for your health, my friend. We prayed for you. This is you, Excel, and Dijle, and Sam, you got something to read? I saw you. you man, you're prepped up. Grab that mic. This is our, this is our friends, you, Excel, and, and Dijle, and, and um, we've had just the honor of walking with them and seeing them over the years and hearing their stories. I mean, you want to talk about some testimony. We need to get their story on video somehow and show it because they're not going to be with us, but how long when, before you leave? Tomorrow. tomorrow. They're leaving tomorrow. So it's going to be an interesting video grab, but we're going to figure that out. But uh, are you going back to Turkey, right? Doing that. They've got some incredible stories of just not only how God has used them, but also some situations that they've been in that really threatened their lives multiple times for the gospel. And uh, man, here they go again. God has called them back. They're going back. And so I know Sam and Leslie, you guys have been walking with them very intimately for a long time as friends. So go ahead and share a little bit. So I'll turn that on there. So Turkey, less than one-tenth of one percent are Christians. So when Jesus told the disciples, uh, I'm sending you as sheep out among wolves, he also promised them that he would never leave them or forsake them. And the Apostle Paul writes in Romans, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And this brother right here, He's been in prison seven times for his faith. He's been near death multiple times. Actually died once and they brought him back. He chooses the longest line at Walmart. You know why? Because that's the line that maybe he can witness to somebody. And that's the heart of Christ that they have. That's right. So we're going to pray for you guys as, just kind of as a commissioning way if we can. Would you guys step down here? Because I'm going to invite the, any of you who would like to come and lay hands on them and just begin to pray, feel free. Sam, don't go far, I want you to pray, okay? So let's just take a moment, and if you want to extend a hand out, just begin to pray for just the favor of God to continue to pour over their life, just provision. I know that there's still some needs there. Um, just all that God desires to do through this family in the days, months, and years to come. Um, Let's just ask the Lord right now just for protection and just all of the purposes of God to just um, to come to life in powerful ways. Many people are going to come to know Jesus. They're going to step into the kingdom because of the ministry call and the mantle on this family. So just begin to pray. Let it rise up. such a beautiful picture of the saints all interceding yeah. all together in one accord yeah. we are one body we are one church Lord yeah. so we just come before you in your presence and that's what we pray most over you excel and delay that your presence just like the pillar of fire and the cloud by day went before you're chosen they are chosen by you and Lord, we just pray an incredible amount of faith and confidence as they move forward into a country that just doesn't know you. We pray that you would just open doors for them. And Lord, that uh, you would protect them in every way. That you would send a legion of your angels just to surround them. We pray for healing over you, Excel, in the powerful, mighty name of Jesus what was done on the cross and the resurrection power, Lord. We pray for restoration. And 
Lord, we just pray that their ministry would yield a hundred, a thousand, a yeah. hundred thousand, a million fold, yeah. as they not only bring the good news to the lost, but they also teach those. Teach those believers, those pastors, those that love you in Turkey yes. to go forth and share the gospel message to a world and a nation that is lost. So, Father, we just commission them, we usher them out right now, and we ask all this in the powerful, mighty resurrection name of your Son, our King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes. Amen. Come on, everybody. Thank you. Hey, before we go this morning, let's, can we just declare our benediction together? Let's do that before we go today. Here we go. Because of what the gospel has done in and to me, my life exists to help people encounter and follow Jesus. We are devoted to scripture and the Holy Spirit, prayer and his presence, communion and community, remembrance and redemption, generosity and grace. As faithful followers of Jesus, we desire authenticity over appearance, intimacy over intellect, passion over performance, kingdom over consumerism, and service over selfishness. We are for Jesus and for people. Amen. Hey, you guys have a great week. Go in peace. We'll see you next week. Love you guys. All right. Take care.